Thank you very much for joining us, everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are uh, around the world. It's my pleasure to open this World Migration Report webinar. My name is Mari McAuliffe and I head up the Migration Research and Publications Division at IOM and also am the editor of the World Migration Report series. Uh, as you may know, the World Migration Report is IOM's flagship publication and it's the global reference report on migration and displacement globally. It's IOM's main contribution to strengthening the global evidence base on migration and migrants worldwide, including to support states in policy formulation and review processes and also in combating misinformation on migration and migrants. We're also finding uh, through uh, the years that IOM's World Migration Report is increasingly used for teaching, both at the tertiary level and increasingly at the secondary level as well. As you may know, it's published every two years and the latest edition, the World Migration Report 2022, was launched last year, late last year, by our Director General at IOM Council, which is our annual general meeting. We organised uh, the first virtual event on the WMR late last year with our Deputy Director General for Operations, we've got Chi Daniels, and we've also looked at global trends. We have delved into, in previous webinars, the regional chapter as well, um, Chapter 3 on regional migration, uh, developments um, and dimensions. And we have also looked at chapter four, which is uh, looking at migration research and analysis and, and UN contributions. We took a deep dive into UN contributions. So as part of this series, we're now moving into uh, the first of the thematic chapters. And what we do in part two of the World Migration Report is look at complex and emerging migration issues. I think today's uh, webinar certainly is not an emerging issue, it is a very complex issue and we're really delighted uh, to have speakers and discussants with us today to share their knowledge and their insights and thoughts. Um, you may know that uh, there's a range of digital tools that we have recently developed such as the well now multi-award winning, award winning World Migration Report interactive platform and I would encourage people to have a look at the interactive platform. We work with some of the best uh, data viz experts in the world on this, as well as an interactive new interactive educators uh, toolkit. And of course, these webinars also uh, are part of our really our obligation in terms of disseminating knowledge on migration and migrants um, globally. And it indeed, it is critical to communicate research and analysis beyond the research community um, to a diverse and a growing audience, uh, given the salience of, of international migration and displacement. And I'm really pleased to see we've got a number of different people, uh, colleagues who we work with, as well as policy officials, practitioners, uh, private sector um, participants, and of course, uh, quite a few researchers I noticed uh, today on the line. Thanks so much for joining us. Having just had the World Environment Day on Sunday and of course the first day, the opening day of the Bonn Climate Change Conference uh, being yesterday. Um, today's webinar will focus on chapter nine of this edition of the World Migration Report which is titled Migration and the Slow Onset Impacts of Climate Change, Taking Stock and Taking Action. The chapter was authored by Mariam Traor uh, Chasnoel together with uh, Alex Randall and they will both be presenting today. Thanks very much for joining us, Mariam and Alex. We really appreciate it. And also for the chapter two, of course. As we know, the issue of migration, environment and climate change is a priority for IOM and it has been for some time. In fact, the oldest publication available on IOM's online publications platform is actually on the topic of environmentally induced population displacements and environmental impacts resulting from mass migration. Sounds fairly recent, but in actual fact, it was based on an international symposium that took place in April 1996. Migration and climate change continues to be a key institutional priority to this very day. And last year, our Director General appointed Ambassador Caroline Dumas to the new position of DG Special Envoy on Climate Action. And of course, there've been many, many research and policy publications produced since the 1996 International Symposium Report, 
including a chapter in the previous edition of the World Migration Report, the 2020 edition, which looked at human mobility and adaptation to environmental change. Undoubtedly, the very high salience of the topic requires that more will be produced, including in the context of an increasingly uncertain world. What we do know, however, is that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change expects climate change to increase displacement into the future. And of course, we already know that this is a reality for many people around the world, particularly in regards to internal displacement. Between 2008 and 2021, for example, droughts and extreme temperatures caused more than 3.5 million new displacements and planned relocation of communities due to slow onset degradation are already taking place in over 60 countries and territories around the world, some sobering figures. Before passing the floor to today's uh, speakers, just a quick reminder that the webinar is recorded and we will be posting this uh, on our website uh, for people to access, uh, just as the previous ones have been posted. If you're interested in looking at global trends or regional dimensions or the UN contributions on migration research and analysis, and in the interest of time, questions will be kept for the Q&A session after the presentation and the discussants have made their remarks. But please do feel free to post uh, questions anytime in the chat function. So without further ado, please uh, let me pass the floor to my colleague, Mariam, who is a senior policy officer in IOM's Department of Policy Research and was previously part of IOM's Migration, Environment and Climate Change Division. Mariam, the floor is yours. Over to you. Thanks. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's such a great pleasure to, to be here and to discuss this chapter that Alex and I wrote. Uh, we started writing it a couple of years ago. So, I mean, Mary, as you said, um, climate change and migration, it's no longer an emerging issue. It's clearly an issue that has emerged. But I think with the more emergence we see and the more complex we realize that the topic is, that there's so many layers to the ways that climate impacts uh, the way people move, um, that we are, I personally feel we're starting to unpacking even more of this complexity. Uh, for many years in the past, there's been a lot of really good research done, um, a lot of um, good uh, field, uh, thinking around what kind of policy responses could be developed to respond to environmental and climate migration. But I feel that uh, the more we talk about the topic and the more we realize how complicated it is and how many dimensions are coming together. So that's also why we did this chapter specifically on slow onset. Um, when we think of climate change and migration, uh, if you look at the media, for instance, um, there is often uh, the tendency to think of people moving uh, linked to disasters, to extreme events that happen and displace a lot of people. But what our colleagues tell us, uh, the one working on the ground, is that they are seeing more and more people moving uh, because of slow changes in the environment. I'm going to start sharing my screen now. Uh, I will keep this presentation very short because I have a call for and we have great discussions. So um, I'll try to keep it short. Let me put the presentation on. Okay, I hope it works, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I need to put it on the full screen. Sorry for that. Here we go. Okay, so um, just as a reminder for the sake of, uh, of this discussion, we're using IOM's um, definition of climate change of environmental migration, which is a very large definition. There's a lot of, of um, discussions around how we should call people me moving because of climate impacts. Uh, we're not going to solve this discussion in this presentation, uh, but for the sake of, uh, of this uh, talk today, we'll use environmental migration. So in the chapter, we're looking at different uh, ways that slow onset changes in the environment interact with the movement of people. And this is kind of a summary of the main uh, issues that we have seen. Some of the points on this slide are related specifically to slow onset um, movements, movements lead to slow onset changes, but some of them are also applicable to environmental migration at large. So essentially, um, I would say that in terms of thinking of policy making to address the negative impacts of climate change on migration, 
one of the most complicated, um, but one of the clearest issue is that people move in different ways in relation to slow onset changes in their environment. They might move, they might look like they're forced to move, let's say when there is uh, a drought, but uh, they can also look like they are choosing to move. And this is, a, this is quite complicated, for instance, when we think of the connection with um, labor migration or economic reasons for people to migrate. Very often, and I think here specifically of a study um, that our colleagues from the UN uh, convention to combat desertification did, uh, very often it is difficult to distinguish what the climate, the weight of climate change and environmental degradation in the decisions to migrate. So for instance, uh, in the case of the study, uh, Moroccan migrants were saying, oh, we're moving primarily for economic reasons. But if you were discussing a bit more with them, the survey made it clear that these economic reasons were linked to um, impacts of climate change on their livelihoods. So sometimes it is evident that people are moving because of uh, a change in the environment, but other times it is hidden behind uh, more of an economic um, um, reason driver of, of migration. Um, another interesting dimension which is linked to slow onset events, it's the connection with uh, conflict peace and security. So this is something that as IOM, we actually want to explore further um, because the literature um, can be quite inconclusive at time. I think it's so far there is widespread agreement that changes in the climate do not necessarily lead to increased conflict. But we're also seeing that in some region, regions, uh, this uh, inter-community conflict is centered around the availability of natural resources. So this is something that needs to be also thought about in terms of policy responses. Um, another important point is the question of uh, urban moving from rural to urban areas. So because slow changes in the environment very often impact the very livelihood of, of rural people, for instance, those who work in agriculture, fishery, and so on, many of them, uh, tend to move to nearby cities as opposed to uh, international migration or moving across border. So we have numerous examples, for instance, in Mongolia of large numbers of people moving from rural to urban areas. But again, this is another dimension that we have as a priority uh, institutionally because we think that more work could be done on, on that. So very quickly in terms, of, in the chapter, we are looking at some of the data uh, related to slow and set uh, events and the impacts it has on the movement of people. I mean, there's a lot in there, you can, you can check it out. I would say that the key thing to remember here is that we do not have complete data, but we have enough data points to know that we simply cannot afford to wait any longer in terms of policy responses. And we also have an idea of the kind of uh, movements that take place, where they're taking place, and um, what are they linked to. So of course, there's always a case to be made for uh, more complete data, more accurate data, more analysis. Clearly, this is needed for policy making, but we cannot use the lack of data as a, an excuse, let's say, to not take um, action now. Uh, linked to that, um, I think it's also important to think of um, the question of projections. I'm sure that in this audience here, you probably have all heard of some um, work done around the number of people who could be migrating because of um, climate impacts, including slow changes in the environment. We're talking about several uh, dozens of millions of people across the world, potentially on the move. So I think clearly the data is telling us that we need to act right now. Um, and this obviously also uh, means working on policy responses. So talking about policy discussions, um, there's been quite a number of work done on the question of migration and climate change in many different policy frameworks at the global, at the regional, at the national level. So again, because climate and migration, it's no longer an emerging issue, but it's an issue that has emerged. Uh, there we have about 10, 15 years of um, global and regional policy discussions on the topic. Some of them have been more influential than others to shape 
the global discourse. So for instance, we have all the work done under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. As you mentioned, Mary, uh, this week is the beginning of um, one of the um, annual uh, climate conferences that takes place in Bonn. And these occasions are always uh, the opportunity to uh, plead for more consideration of migration issues in the discussions that take place under the global climate negotiations. But having said that, there is already a work stream under the UNFCCC, uh, which is linked to something called the Task Force on Displacement. What is interesting here is that this Task Force on Displacement a few years ago produced um, recommendations on what states could do to address the impacts of climate change on uh, the movement of people. And this text is slowly but surely being uh, adopted. Uh, I mean, being, let's say, it inspires national policy development. For instance, in countries like Kyrgyzstan, uh, Azerbaijan, there's been some policy analysis made by the government to figure out whether the national policy frameworks are um, adequate to support the implementation of the recommendation of this task force on displacement. And of course, uh, the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration is another major um, source of guidance. The 2018 document that was uh, adopted by states did acknowledge that uh, states needed to address drivers, environmental and climate drivers of migration, but also that uh, more regular migration pathways would be needed for those unable to return to areas which were impacted by uh, climate change. So what is interesting here is that in the recent, uh, a few weeks ago, we had the, uh, the uh, International Migration Review Forum, the IMRF, and again, this question of flexibility and availability of regular migration pathways was discussed and it was included in the progress declaration that were adopted uh, by the states who attended the conference. So all that to say that there are many, many ways um, in which policy responses can address some of the um, most negative impacts of climate change on the movement of people, including when this movement takes place in a context of slow changes in the environment. But what is maybe interesting for us as well uh, as the migration agency is to think of this question of um, um, regular migration pathways and what it means for national policymakers, especially to work on this dimension. So I'll stop very shortly. I just wanted to um, highlight that uh, the chapter also has uh, an analysis of some of these uh, decisions that migration policymakers, especially at the national level, could be taking to respond to um, environmental migration. Uh, these kind of decisions would be in line with the text that we just mentioned, the GCM and the um, um, Task Force on Displacement recommendations. So in a way, um, it would be, I think in the future, it would be like a great step forward would be to see more national policy frameworks revised or tweaked or developed to actually try to implement uh, this global guidance that we have into national policy making. And with this I'll stop because it's been 10 minutes and uh, I uh, give the floor a bit to Alex because he's the co-author of this chapter and he has other perspective on the topic. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed, Mariam. As you uh, have highlighted there, especially in your last slide, uh, there are opportunities in terms of, of policy responses and policy action. And as also the chapter goes into, there are some really great examples around some of the, um, the initiatives and the policy frameworks that have been implemented. Now let me turn to um, Alex Randall. And Alex is the Program Manager at Climate and Migration, the Climate and Migration Coalition. And he uh, really brought to life in the chapter 
the impacts in terms of migrants and migrants' voices, uh, to bring it to life. It, you know, we do deal with data, we do with research and policy, but sometimes it's very good, and we try to do this in the World Migration Report through different mechanisms to bring to life some of the impacts on migrants and migrants' communities. So, um, Alex, I will hand over to you, and you can take us through uh, your particular very interesting contribution in regards to migrants' voices. Alex, over to you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks to the organisers. And of course, thanks to uh, Mariam, the co-author on this chapter. Um, and thank you for the introduction. I was brought uh, into this chapter to do something quite specific, and that was to, um, exactly as Marie has said, try and bring some life to, um, to the content. And the way that we did that was to use a series of testimonies from people who are on the move, from migrants, from people who've been displaced, um, uh, talking about their own experience and specifically talking about the ways in which climate change and changes to the environment had shaped their mobility. So literally people in their own words describing the story of their movement, the journey that they've taken, and focusing on the ways in which droughts, rainfall variability, disasters of different kinds, heat waves, sea level rise, had shaped their movement and were part of their story of migration. And what we wanted to do was rather than simply just presenting these testimonies and saying, here they are, what we wanted to do was connect the stories that these migrants, displacees and refugees had told with the data and the analysis that was in the chapter. And we felt that was really important. These shouldn't just be testimonies, people's experiences standing alone, disconnected from um, what we were trying to say in the report chapter. We really wanted to, to show that the evidence that has come from decades of research on this is in fact also rooted in people's experiences. People's day-to-day -day experiences, often difficult, often traumatic, um, are actually a reflection of the data and the evidence that have been collected over the years. So we were really keen to show that connection, bring that data to life and, and kind of ground this chapter as far as we could in, in the reality of, um, of what people are actually experiencing when they have an environmental or a climate change dimension to their mobility. And what I wanted to do with this, um, with, my, with my few minutes here, is just share with you one particular testimony that really stuck out for me. We, we, we gathered about um, six or seven, I think, for the, for the chapter, but there's one that I just keep coming back to. And it's a testimony that was collected a number of years ago um, by a group of researchers working in Mexico. So I should add, these aren't testimonies that we gathered specifically for this report. They are testimonies that, that we've been kind of collecting and bringing together over, over years um, from other researchers and other sources. But there's this, there's this one particular testimony that I keep coming back to, and we used it in this chapter, and I, I, I use it in lots of presentations because I think it just reveals so much about the connection between climate change and human mobility. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to share my screen. I'm going to show you the testimony and I'm then I'm, I'm going to kind of walk us through how we used these testimonies to illustrate some of the points that are made in the report. So if you will bear with me just for a second, I'm going to share my screen and show my slides. So hopefully you can see my screen now. And I'll just give you a moment to, to read that testimony to yourselves, just a few seconds, just to digest it. And what I wanna do now is just pull out a few key things from this testimony, which I think demonstrate some really, really key points about the connections between climate change and human mobility. Um, points that have been touched on already and I'm sure we will return to in our conversation. The first one is about droughts and rainfall variability and what we can see from this testimony is that drought rainfall vari variability 
are so often part of the picture when people move, when people migrate. But what I think we can see that's really important here is it's not straightforwardly just a lack of rainfall that is driving this person's mobility. It is a change in the pattern of rainfall. It doesn't have to be an extreme drought. It doesn't have to be a persistent multi-year drought. In fact, relatively subtle changes in when rain falls can make the difference between a successful year for a farm and an unproductive year for a farm. And then from that shape, whether someone needs to migrate, whether they need to move in order to protect their livelihood because of that rainfall variability. And I think that's a really key point. We aren't necessarily talking about um, extreme droughts. It doesn't necessarily take um, the most severe or most catastrophic droughts that we've ever seen to reshape patterns of mobility in a particular area. It only takes variability to potentially shift and alter those patterns of where people can and can't find a livelihood. The second thing that I think is really, really interesting in this testimony is clearly um, the person here is talking about engaging in a pattern of seasonal and circular migration. And I think in the media, we are very often presented with a view, an image of climate linked mobility that sees this movement as being permanent that people will go on a one-way journey from their current location to a new location where they will settle and live forever. But actually, a lot of the evidence that we have points to people using migration, using mobility as a way of shoring up their livelihood, as a livelihood strategy. And when they do that, they very often don't migrate permanently. People move initially, perhaps during a period of drought and then return, perhaps when the drought alleviates. People very often migrate um, during the quieter parts of the agricultural calendar to find work elsewhere and then return during the busier parts of the agricultural calendar as a way of shoring up their livelihood. So I think although it is certainly the case that perhaps in the future, as the more severe, the more extreme impacts of climate change take hold, perhaps if the mitigation strategies that the world is currently working on are not as successful as we might hope, of course, it may be that many people do move permanently and there are people who are moving permanently now. But we should also remember that at the moment, many people are engaging in this pattern of seasonal and circular migration as a way of securing a livelihood for themselves. Finally, what we can see here is a really clear example of um, climate linked mobility looking much more like economic migration. And I think this is a really important thing to understand. The ways in which climate change reshapes patterns of migration is so often via the economy and then via the labor market. What we can see here from this person's experience is that the driving force behind their migration or part of the driving force behind their migration is looking to secure an income. Their income has been eroded by the rainfall variability that their area has experienced. So it may be that many of the people who have an environmental or um, specifically slow onset climate change dimension to their movement would in fact describe themselves, would describe their own experience as being one which is more like economic migration. It may be that they are counted when it comes to um, the statistics as, as migrants moving to find work rather than people moving due to the slow onset impacts of climate change. So I think that's a really important point for us to remember. Just because um, someone doesn't immediately define themselves as being a quote climate change migrant or having a very obvious climate or environmental dimension to their mobility does not necessarily mean that within their story, within their experience, and within the drivers of their movement, there may in fact be a climate change dimension.
the reason that I keep coming back to this testimony, the reason that I think it's so interesting is because to me, it really tells us something about the complexity of the issue. What we can see here is someone who is moving um, in a seasonal and circular way. They're not moving in a straightforward one way um, migration pattern. They're moving because of rainfall variability. They're moving um, even though the rainfall variability hasn't completely decimated the agricultural area that they are from. Um, and, and, and finally, they are describing their own mobility as being existing at this nexus between the environment and the economy and the labor market. And I think that shows us so many important things about how these issues are connected. So I'm gonna unshare my screen now. Um, and I think I've uh, just about used up my 10 minutes. Is that right? Right. Um, thank you very much, Alex. And yeah, thank you for thank you for your time. For and taking us and, and, and yeah, and stepping us through that. Certainly um, uh, when uh, researchers, but also program managers working on migration around the world, you might be working in an embassy, you might be running a visa program in partic particular kind of uh, type of visa. It's very interesting when people tell their stories, they're not thinking in policy categories. They're not thinking about uh, whether they would fall into, you know, environmental displacement or whether they would fall into a kind of slow onset impact uh, climate change type of scenario. People are just telling their stories, telling their lives uh, stories and how they are adapting and adjusting. And that's one thing that I think resonates when you're working in um, migration practice, delivering programmatic responses, delivering operational uh, responses, including, uh, of course, in humanitarian and uh, displacement contexts, but also in visa programming. And, and Alex has just highlighted that um, beautifully in terms of understanding then what those connections are to policy and the policy responses and the policy officials around the world who then have to grapple with not just individual stories and testimonies, but how to deal with issues at scale. And as a policymaker, that's often a real challenge because anybody can come up with a bespoke response. But when you start to see issues change in terms of migration patterns and processes at scale, that's when you get into some of the so-called wicked problems um, uh, in migration and some of the real challenges, especially in regards to uh, rights of migrants and, and protection, with the small p protection. Let me turn to uh, Felicitas, our first discussant. We're really delighted, of course, uh, to be joined by two discussants as well as uh, the authors who can really offer their insights as experts in this particular topic. And of course, the first um, discussant uh, today who will be speaking is Felicitas Hillman, who's a professor at the Institute for Urban and Regional Planning at the Technical University in Berlin, um, and is um, herself uh, a specialist in this area and is able to provide some real insights um, from her experiences. I'll hand over to Felicitas now for your remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. Thanks Thank you, everybody. Welcome, everybody. I am delighted to be here and to comment on this marvelous report. So thank you for the opportunity. I'm going to share my slides here. Oh, my goodness. Could you open the slide I sent? I just sent you. Excuse me. Sure. I think we will ask Adrian if you wouldn't mind sharing your screen. I'm sorry. I it's a big file. It looks great. <laughs> Listen, I mean, thank you, but maybe that's the issue. Absolutely sharing it. Now. That's thank fine. You, if you just could open much. it, that's fine. So the report is much needed as it raises awareness about the complexities of migration, mobility, and human development. We speak about so-called wicked problems, and Maui said so a moment ago. Could you just please open the... Excuse me, I cannot see that. Okay, that is fine. Can you see my slides now? Yes, yeah, yes, looks perfect. Great. Thanks. So the central aim of the World Migration Report is to set out in clear and accurate terms, and I quote here, the changes occurring in migration and mobility globally. It has an obligation to demystify the complexity of human mobility. The report brings innovative and long overdue aspects into the debate. 
the lottery of birth, for example, a passport index, the role of visa regimes. And this goes together a lot with climate change. The report develops a global perspective and it points, the report also points to the pros and cons of academic and non-academic research. It sees intergovernmental research as a main producer of knowledge by now. So in my comment, I would like to speak in the view of an academic. Chapter nine deals with the impact of slow onset processes of climate change on migration. To include this chapter was a wise decision. It is of great value. Despite this, I feel it goes still a little bit too little beyond the notion of the management of migration. Here I see some potentials to fulfill the aim of the report, as it says in its introduction. The chapter outlines the amb ambiguity of migration to, de to be defined either as a loss and damage, as written down in the Cancun Agreement, uh, or migration as a normal adaptation strategy. It underlines the rural-urban divide. Its main message is about the need of planned relocation policies that could also be critical in facilitating safe and orderly migration. I feel we even need another type of knowledge here to come to grips with the complexities of migration. Four years ago, in 2018, we did interviews with the Ghanaian with the Ewe diaspora to find out what the role of the diaspora is in the context of climate change and what narrations are transmitted by the diaspora to the place of origin. And the place of origin here was the Gulf of Guinea. So listen to that person. In one way or the other, one can say also environmental change also has to do with international migration because environmental change affects the people also in the city, not only in the villages. When there are no jobs, there's nothing happening in the country. Everybody wants to leave. There is no easy access to use water. There's no easy access to electricity. Everything is completely down. The farmlands are not good. The water bodies are not producing enough fish because there are too many people going to the same water every day. And then discussing a bit more, diving deeper into the into the um, world of this person or those persons, they said overviews and profit seeking became part of the explanation. Listen to that person. So foreign investors are into business and their main aim is to make a profit. They started to do salt mining throughout the whole year. So whether the salt, the water level goes down or not, they will, they have means of getting their salt. And that is what is affecting the local people at the moment. I think they are even dwelling underground to get the salt and it's affecting the water system. So the bigger structure. Speaking about climate change means, speaking about the tip of the iceberg, what we will see in the next years is the melting of the iceberg and all of the embedded problems, with problems of slow onset events popping up. Just a few thoughts I want to present here. We have seen for many years... Um, sorry, sorry, Felicitas. Yeah. Uh, sorry, just a second. Apologies. Uh, the screen was a bit stuck on this side. Uh, ah, just on my screen it to... works, excuse me. No, because we're sharing on my side and uh, sorry about that. It froze for a bit here. Okay. Which slide are you on currently? Um, just jump over the two with a quote. Okay. Go ahead, please. Because I see my slides. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, okay. Then the next one, next. Go to the next, please, yeah. Okay. Perfect. So three uh -huh. thoughts. I think we have seen for many years business models prevailing that or that dominate our economies, which are um, difficult um, concerning environmental change. So we have industrialized agricultural systems and we have little acceptance of traditional knowledge and long-term sustainable ways of thinking. So think of the loss of biodiversity, for example. There are many cases of such man-made degradations deforestation, oil extraction, many more. Some of them, such as, such as the setting up of infrastructures, such as sea defenses, dams, and polarization, are known to shift the problems rather than to solving them. So, and sometimes these big structures are even legitimized with climate change, for example, rising sea levels. 
I think we must focus much more on the impact of such infrastructural changes and the role of man-made um, environmental change for in and out migration. So we must go beyond the broad scope of climate change, but much, much more into environmental change. Second point, we must explain also that different types of mobility, and this is said in the beginning of the report, are entangled with each other and that they, came with, with a, that they come with a different price tag regarding the climate. I wish there would be more discussion on resource consuming forms of mobility in the global north, also, such as cruise tourism, for example. And instead of discussing the mobility of vulnerable people in the global south, so I see there's an imbalance and we must think of shifting the focus of the debate also to the consequences of our consumeristic lifestyle, which is associated with mobilities, the expectation towards mobilities. My third point, Greta Thunberg says she wants us to panic. Now we see that people start to migrate internally due to slow onset climate change processes and will even will do so even more by the year 2050. However, when creating an appropriate response, panic is not a good advisor. The report mentions that we have little data on migration and climate change. This is true, but it's also true that we need to look much more, to focus much more on the dynamics. And this is what Mariama just Mariam just said before. The report, please go ahead once. One further, please. The way to go. So the report also highlights the humanitarian development and peace nexus as inspired by the SDGs and related to migration. I think this is exactly the way to go, to focus on the dynamics, to look on peace, fragility, migration and development as an ensemble, as an assemblage, and the preservation of knowledge that we need about sustainable development. There must be must more, more long-term, more local and more contextualized approaches to master the challenges of climate change. It is less about big technological solutions, but about small scale human and environmentally friendly action, including migration as an adaptation strategy. Even though the authors mentioned that there are too many, um, too, too many long-term projects with generally little geographical coverage, I think we must go to this long-term understanding of the patterns of recorded movements. And the role of academia I see here to come up with new connections, to make connections visible, and to think independently from hasty policy needs. So, there is no longer an excuse to take action, this is true, but we need also new connections in what we look at. That would be my comment to this chapter. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Felicitas, and you've uh, traversed actually quite a lot of the report there, not just the chapter, including, you know, the environmental transformations that we talk about along with the big geopolitical transformations and the technological transformations in chapter one, uh, the report overview, with a signal to looking at, you know, what is on the horizon and what we're likely to be seeing in terms of complex and emerging issues. You're quite right, of course, in terms of looking at new connections and new um, forms of migration and mobility and what they mean in terms of uh, uh, climate change. But as Mariam said, and I wholeheartedly agree with this, including as a former policymaker, you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater, as we would say in Australia, right. and utilising the very rich and growing um, evidence base for understanding what the future dynamics look like, looking at the current, looking at the current situation and the past and those long term trends. Why um, do a historical research and analysis when you can actually draw on a wealth of information. And so that particular area in terms of climate change, I would love to say that we don't need to be dealing with it in the next edition of the World Migration Report, the 2024 edition. The unfortunate reality is that we will have to again uh, cover climate change and migration, but we will again be looking at a specific segment of it. We can't just cover 
migration and climate change. It's way too big. So we have looked at human mobility and adaptation, and we have looked at the slow onset impacts um, because, again, it's it's just too big and complex to be able to chew off on, on a very, very large topic such as migration and climate change impacts. I'll now turn, uh, with thanks to Felicitas, we'll now turn to uh, Robert McClellan. And of course, Robert um, is one of uh, the world's leading experts, of course, in this particular area and has worked across policy and research. So has a deep knowledge, of course, um, in both worlds. Robert is currently a professor in the Department of Geography and Environmental Studies. Um, he's a teacher, he's a researcher. Again, as I mentioned, he's also a policymaker previously, um, and he's at Wilfrid Laurier University. I think we'll have uh, Robert's bio in the chat as well. So I will now hand over to uh, Robert for his remarks. And thanks, thanks again for joining Thanks very much. Us. And uh, thanks IOM for having me at this great uh, event uh, to launch a really important resource. I think that uh, it was mentioned earlier that a lot of folks use this as a teaching uh, and learning tool, and uh, I certainly do. So uh, it's a wonderful report, and thank you very much for the opportunity to comment on this particular chapter. Uh, congratulations to Miriam and Alex for their hard work on this. I think they've done a really nice job uh, trying to distill a really complex set of issues into a readable format, yet, ex yet at the, uh, still at the same time maintain the technical uh, accuracy that we, we want to see as well from the perspective of researchers and policymakers. So well done. Uh, a few thoughts then. I don't have any slides, so I'm afraid you have to look at my, my mug for the next few minutes, but I'll try to keep it short and try to bridge into some Q&A and discussion and some things that I've seen pop up in the chat uh, so far. Um, I'd like to focus on the, the slower emerging risks associated with climate change. I was actively involved in the writing of Chapter 7 of the uh, Working Group 2 report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and we did a deep dive into the risks associated both pre uh, currently and in the future, uh, the risks associated with climate change, both in terms of sudden onset events, uh, but also longer term risks. And Alex, in his examples, was talking, for example, about changing precipitation regimes, which is which is a big one. Uh, and I like the fact that he focused on it, it doesn't take much in terms of a subtle change to a system to throw that system uh, out of balance. So agricultural systems are geared very closely to particular uh, particular growing conditions and even the change of a few weeks um, in terms of timing of precipitation or volume of precipitation can have huge direct impacts on people who are in their livelihoods, and also the indirect impacts as, as we're seeing right now with food prices around the world, obviously being affected by the conflict in Ukraine uh, right now, but even a small perturbation caused by climate uh, to food production systems in an exporting region, whether it's the prairies of Canada, whether it's the grain fields in Australia, even a small perturbation can cause rippling consequences for people all around the world. And I'm afraid we're gonna see more and more of this in coming years. Uh, rising temperatures, uh, just generally, that threshold starts to move up and up. Uh, and we're seeing this already in South Asia, parts of Southern Europe, where ambient temperatures are becoming so hot, it's difficult to conduct work. It's difficult to simply stay cool. Um, and as we move into this hotter future, this becomes a reality is that some places will become very difficult to inhabit. Um, and these habitability risks are often urban environments. The very places where rural people are moving to uh, are becoming more and more challenging places to live. Um, and in those rural areas, not only do we have the impacts in agricultural systems, we have you know, longer fire seasons, which is becoming a, gr a greater risk for displacement. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that's going on. Uh, in my own country, uh, last year in British Columbia in the mountains, uh, it, the temperatures reached uh, nearly 50 degrees Celsius. That's Arabian desert temperatures in the mountains of Western North America. Uh, fires broke out, over 500 people lost their lives. Uh, we're already seeing these sorts of impacts. And then, of course, coming over the horizon very quickly are things related to sea level rise. And I, I personally am working uh, with a group in a community called Tuktoyaktuk in Northern Canada, where the plans are being made to relocate that community because the, the location of the community is untenable uh, in the next 25 to 30 years because of rising sea levels and the increased risk of floods and erosion and so on. Uh, so these are not hypothetical risks. These are, these are real and actual. 
Uh, and the report does a nice job of sort of summarizing some of the key ones. And Alex's uh, quote, I'm going to come back to that in a moment, uh, really captured some of this. I like how the report functions, focuses on multi-causality uh, because it's very rare that, you know, climate change itself is the driver of migration. I mean, certainly we get sudden onset events, like a hurricane comes and knocks down all the houses and people are displaced. Okay, we can see there's a climatic driver, but often it's more part and parcel of a variety of challenges that households have to cope with. And sometimes that mix of environmental, social, economic, and political challenges causes people to decide, okay, I need to move um, at this point in time. So that's really important. And I encourage folks to, to, to look closely at what uh, Alex and Miriam have done in the chapter on that. Uh, the multidimensionality of the impacts of climate change, slower onset events, uh, is super important. The impacts on housing, on infrastructure, on health, on employment opportunities, labor markets, and so on. So it's not just a clear, you know, here's a here's a climate risk and here's a, a an outcome. It's often intertangled with one another. And those impacts can have different scales of impacts. It can be a very localized displacement. It can be a wider scale challenge to uh, habitability. And it can have different temporal scales. It can have seasonal risk, permanent risks, and so on. And so as a result, the outcomes can often be multi-scalar. And as Alex mentioned, mentioned Sometimes it leads to temporary migration, temporary displacement return. Sometimes part of the household moves, part of the household stays behind. Other times you get permanent, you get local movements, you get international movements as well. Um, and this is where we get into the context of adaptation that Felicitas was talking about, because migration and mobility more generally needs to increasingly be viewed within the context of adaptation to climate change. And obviously adaptation is itself contingent on the wealth of households, the wealth of communities, the wealth of governments. It depends upon institutional capacity and governance mechanisms and so on. And there's increasingly uh, linkages to health and health system adaptation as well. And if you just think about, for example, access to cooling, access to high quality housing, these become part and parcel of these development trajectories where our longer term development in rural areas, in urban areas needs to be more climate resilient. Um, and so um, within that context, migration and mobility is important. The question becomes, how do we make migration effective in terms of adaptation? How do we make it something that I, I should back up and say, I'm very biased in this respect. I'm pro-migration. My wife is an immigrant. My mom's an immigrant. So you know where I'm coming from when I say migration is a good thing. But it's a good thing only when people have agency. That's when they're able to move legally. They're able to move with some degree of freedom. They're able to integrate into labor markets of their generation. They're able to remit money home. When those conditions are in place, and Miriam picked up on this when she talked about, for example, the compact on safe and orderly migration. When those conditions are in place. Migration can be a very successful way of helping adaptation, not just for the migrants themselves, but for the sending community and for the, the, the receiving communities as well. And of course, what we're seeing at a global scale is sort of a pushback from governments uh, on two scales. One is on the international scale. Governments are increasingly trying to restrict and prevent mobility and migration. And obviously that works completely counter to, uh, to making migration and mobility more, more successful as an adaptation. And internally within uh, countries, we see policymakers seeing adaptation as a means of preventing people from moving within their countries. And again, that is not the trajectory we want to see it. We want to see within a broader holistic climate resilient set of pathways. Alex's example of, I think it was a person from Mexico who goes to Wyoming each year to work for a few months and to bring home uh, income to their family. The key question is, is that individual legally able to do so? Do they have worker protections when they're in Wyoming? Do they have access to safe housing, safe labor conditions? Are they moving legally so that they're not having to pay smugglers or to dodge immigration authorities and so on? Because that same act of moving from Mexico to Wyoming and back to earn money Depending on the conditions under which it happens, it can benefit everybody or it can increase the risks to everybody involved. And so that's something that we need to think about. So my final point is on the client, on the policy challenges. And I saw there was a question in the chat about this. What can we do? I think what governments need to do is they need to walk and chew gum at the same time. It's to look at 
climate change and migration and sustainable development, not as little silos to be tackled by different ministries and, and sets of bureaucrats, but to be integrated into thinking about how can we make all of these work collectively in a policy framework that advances uh, sustainable development. And the chapter does a great job showing what our different policy mechanisms are to achieving that. Uh, and so hopefully uh, I'll hand this back to the organizers. Hopefully this tees up a little bit of discussion in the remaining moments. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Robert. And um, I think it, we also hear a lot about, you know, working across different silos and different ministries within within governments. And that is challenging, to be to be frank. In my experience, it can be very, very challenging to work like that within um, governments. However, what I would say is, given that um, migration and climate change and climate change more broadly is one of the global issues of our time, prioritizing those um, connections within governments and also regionally, sub-regionally and also globally, I think is, is the point, uh, one of the key points of the chapter and one of the key points in including it uh, in the context of the World Migration Report and continuing the discussion and the dialogue through various mechanisms, including IMRF, um, amongst many others. So we might not be able to sort of break down those silos and work across um, uh, different governments on a whole range of issues, but I think everybody's in agreement that this is probably the one issue that we really do need to focus on most definitely for, especially for our children and our grandchildren and our unborn uh, great-grandchildren sort of futures and so forth. We do have a few questions in the chat. We are almost out of time, but what I would um, ask our authors and our discussants, if it is okay with you, if we go a little bit over time, the uh, attendees have very keenly put in questions in the chat. So I would like to um, really ask, particularly the authors in the first instance, the first question is about policy. And so particularly for Mariam, if you would like to handle that, I know you can see it also in the chat there, but I'll just um, repeat this for people who are online. Uh, a lot has been said about policymakers having to respond, but the complex is very, the topic is very complex. What are the, in terms of the big question is how should policies um, be framed? What should policies look like? Thank you, Amanda. Thank you so much. Well, I think Robert mentioned uh, quite a few uh, uh, points there. Uh, but I think listening to this discussion, um, and I was looking at the question, I was trying to, you know, to think of something witty to respond to. But then I was thinking it's such a difficult question. It is because everything is related to, to something else. As you said, we, we need policymakers to work together, but uh, we also have examples in some countries of um, specific policies on young climate change and migration. Um, so there's, there's just so many things that could be happening in terms of policy discussions to respond to these questions. But having said that, um, both respondents also mentioned the question of political political will of states and um, political sensitivities. So from that perspective, I think there is a limit to um, what can be done in terms of policy responses. And that limit uh, is probably around something Robert mentioned, which is uh, admitting more, um, more migrants. Having said that, I don't think um, this is an excuse to not discuss um, regular pathways for people affected by climate impacts. I think it's clear that this is um, something that where uh, countries can take um, like concrete action, whether it's developing labor migration agreements, whether it's uh, implementing regularization program, uh, there's a lot that can concretely be done. But also from a political perspective, um, and that also goes back to the second question, which is what can we do to address uh, internal migration? Well, clearly there's a lot of focus on addressing the drivers, uh, the climate and environmental drivers of migration so people don't move, which is not always detrimental when the people do not want to move, but can become a problem if people want to move. So what does it mean in terms of policy responses? Um, it's basically taking into account uh, the migration dimensions, the movement mobility dimensions of existing climate change mitigation and adaptation measures. Um, amplify the work already done in the hope that um, this kind of mitigation and adaptation work will reduce uh, migration. But if I may say it's in theory and ideally it should only be reducing 
uh, forced migration, people who don't want to move and not necessarily keep people um, in place. Over. Thank you very much, um, Mariam. I'll, I'll hand over to Alex, very conscious of time. And, and Alex's uh, kind of key point really in terms of uh, policy is listening to people, thinking about their stories, their impacts and what that then translates to in terms of policy frameworks and policy responses, which is a bit of kind of mental gymnastics often, including when you're working in policy environments, because you have a range of disparate and sometimes conflicting information and evidence that you have to take into account. Um, so let me hand over to Alex and more broadly, not just on the chapter, Alex, but from your experience, I'm sure that you've got some very rich insights to share. Yeah, uh, thank you. And uh, thank you to our questioner as well. Um, yeah, it's a really great question. And I think um, one of the key things that I think it's important to understand about the way a lot of policymakers approach this question is very often they, they approach it with the wrong question, right? They come to it saying, what policies, if they're on board, if they're, if they're kind of interested, what policies do we need to deal with climate link migration and displacement? And in a lot of ways, frustrating as it is, that's very often the, the wrong question because what I think our chapter demonstrated is that it's very difficult to isolate one group of people and say, here is, here is a group who are moving exclusively because of climate change impacts and they can be categorized and they're likely to be moving from A to B at this date and these are likely to be their needs and this is the migratory route that is that they're likely to take, right? That just isn't how it works. You've got people moving for all, all kinds of like complex reasons of which climate change is, is a backdrop or it's in the mix. And I think what that entails is creating, um, my, creating policies which protect all migrants, which protect all people who are on the move, right? Which don't necessarily isolate or try to isolate people moving because of the impacts of climate change. Now, that doesn't mean that policymakers can then just go, okay, great, well, there's nothing we need to do. You've just told me that this isn't, you know, a policy area that we can actually um, meaningfully create policy on. What I think it means is that the policymakers need to step back kind of one, one step and say, what does it look like to protect all migrants, all refugees and all people on the move in an era of climate change? I think that's the way to approach, approach this policy question. Thank you very much, Alex. And that is increasingly um, being asked uh, in a range of different forums as, uh, as Mariam certainly pointed out earlier. I would like to just quickly hand over to Felicitas and then to Robert for any final remarks. We have got other questions in the chat, but they are much more specific to geographic location. So I think I will just go to Felicitas and Robert. Um, yeah, just to ask their thank you. Thank you so much for this very inspiring webinar for this great chapter. And yeah, thank you for presenting these views to me, to us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Robert, over to you. Just briefly, uh, thanks again so much, like Felicitas, in terms of those who are asking policy-related questions uh, in the chat. I guess I would encourage you to encourage the people you work with or the policymakers you have influence over to, to ask them when they start to think about migration, whether it's just migration policy generally or migration policy in the context of environmental change, to start with the question, how can we make this work better for everyone involved? If they start from that departure point, I think then the, the, the policy pathways are more promising than if you say, oh, hold on a sec, this is something we're kind of worried about. How do we prevent this from happening? I mean, the root cause, if you want to prevent climate migration from happening, uh, you know, cut back on your greenhouse gas emissions. That's the ultimate <laughs> uh, policy decision. But apart from that, on the migration side of things, just ask, how can we make this work for everyone? Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much indeed, Robert. Uh, any last thoughts, Mariam or Alex, just want to make sure that you are able to cover all the issues that you want to cover? Um, the, this is it's such a rich discussion. Every time I'm listening to a webinar about climate change migration in general, it, you know, we always realize that there's so much more to the issue than uh, what we started discussing in the first place. So I'm sure there's a lot more that could be said, but I think we have covered some of the, of the main points. Thank you so much, Mary. It was really a pleasure to be here.
Thank you, Mariam. And um, I would encourage people to go and read the chapter um, that Mariam and Alex have put together for us for the World Migration Report. Any last final comments from you, Alex? Just want to give you a chance. Just to extend my thanks to obviously um, a co uh, Mariam, our co-author, and the discussants, and to IOM uh, for putting together the event. It's been a it's thank been you a very much to indeed. Meet you all. Thanks so much. And sorry we didn't get to all of the questions. We are way over time. And special thanks to our authors, Mariam and Alex, and also to Robert and Felicitas. We've really appreciated your inputs today. And we will, as we said, we're recording this, so we will be posting uh, the webinar, including with our tech problems, apologies for that, um, onto our uh, webpage shortly. And we'll certainly be able to send out the link um, to everybody who's who's been involved. Thanks again. And uh, hopefully people online will be able to join us for the next World Migration Report webinar. Thanks again. Bye.